Hello, folks. This is Pastor Mike Hoggard, pastor of Bethel Church in Festus, Missouri, head of prophetic research ministry with a very special edition of the Watchman video broadcast. We're going to be talking about numbers and Bible numbers, scripture numerics, Bible prophecy. We're going to be talking about a lot of things in these uh, a whole series of videos that we're doing on what we call the King James Code, scripture numerics, Bible prophecy. This is actually our signature series, and we've done several versions of this over the years. And uh, as the need has arisen, and as my study of the Word of God has grown, uh, I decided to do uh, what I feel like is going to be a very comprehensive uh, study of Bible numerics. I'm not going to tell you anything that I don't know. I'm just going to give you some things that I do know. And we hope to do several things. Number one, we hope to encourage you as a Bible student to study the Word of God and understand the numbers that are given to us in the Scripture. And I'm not going to talk about uh, any occult thing. I'm not going to talk about uh, uh, Bible codes, as it were, the equidistant letter sequence or anything like that. I'm simply dealing with the numbers that are contained in the plain English text uh, of, of the Bible. So that's one of the things that we want to accomplish. Another thing that we want to do is that we want to show you the magnificence of the Word of God itself, but particularly the King James Version of the Bible. And we have a lot of things, we have a lot of videos that talk about the King James Version, and I'm not going to get into actually defending the King James on these videos. All I'm going to do is show you the marvelous numerical and textual structure, the patterns that are in the King James Version of the Bible. And I promise you, that if you'll watch these videos with an open mind, if you'll study these things out for yourself and go to the Scriptures, you'll see that the King James truly, truly is the most amazing book that is on planet Earth right now. And uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of my background, a little bit of my, of my testimony. Back in 1997, the Lord called me into a study of Bible prophecy. And I said, Lord, that's great. Let's go. And I'm going to go find some books on prophecy at the bookstore. And God said, now just wait a minute. I wrote a book of prophecy. I wrote a sure word of prophecy. There are some things in there that I want you to see. And so I surrendered to the Lord and I said, Lord, that's fine. You just show me where you want me to go. And that's where the Lord took me. So I began to study numbers. Now I will say that I read uh, E.W. Bollinger's work on Scripture Numerics, Ed Velo's book on Scripture Numerics. And as I remember as I was reading those books, I remember looking at their definitions for Bible numbers. Now, what I know of E.W. Bollinger and Ed Velo and the work that they've done uh, is that they were intense study, studiers or students of the Word of God. And I respect the work they did. And I don't, I don't think that in anything that I'm going to say on these videos is going to contradict uh, anything that they said on Scripture numerics. But what I did was, as I was reading through their work, and I saw their list of numbers and what they said they meant, I said, Lord, I'm not satisfied with that. I want to know from the Bible itself what exactly these numbers mean. And so I began to take what Bullinger said, I began to take what Ed Velo said, and I began to look at them objectively from the Scripture to try to determine whether or not what they were saying was true. And that's what I want you to do with these videos, is that I want you to be a Berean. I want you to be a student of the Word of God, and I want you to go to the Scriptures themselves to find out whether or not these things that I'm going to show you on these, on these videos are actually true or not. Now, if you look at the verse here, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33, you see that the Bible says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. One of the things that, that came across to me right off the bat as I'm studying Bible numerics, as I'm studying the King James for what it is, and I'm studying the language use of the Scripture, is that I recognize that everything has an order to it and everything has a pattern. God is not the author of of confusion, the Bible says. Well, an author writes books, and God wrote a book, and it's the Bible that we have. And notice that it says, God is not the author of confusion. So what this verse would mean is that God is the author of order. And we can clearly see how everything in the universe has an order to it. Everything has a pattern. Everything just seems to fall in place in everything that, that God created. And because He created these things based upon His Word, then we must also understand that the Word of God itself is in perfect order. Not just in the Hebrew, 
not just in the Aramaic, not just in the original Greek, but in the translation that we have of the Word of God. And what I'm going to do throughout the series of these DVDs is show you that, yes, the Word of God is in perfect order. Now, I will tell you that when, when God sort of laid it on my heart to study Bible numerics, I was, I was kind of afraid of that because I'd always associated that with occult numerology, and I really wouldn't, I, I wouldn't have anything to do with it. But what I found from the scriptures, and that's one of the things that I really stick on, is that if I see it in the Bible, then I'm going to believe it. One of the things that I found in the scriptures is that God shows us that wisdom comes from numbers. And then the, all, the whole thing of the Bible is that there are things that talk about numbers. The Bible uses the word added, subtracting, or taking away, multiplying, dividing. Those are numerical terms. We see that numbers uh, sort, of, sort of equal who, who God is. Numbers never change. Numbers are infinite. We will never count. We, we can't even count the beginning number. I know we have zero, but if you go into negative numbers, they, they end up going into affinity that way. And numbers go into affinity the other way. We never will count the last number, and they never change, and they never have, and they never will. And they sor sort of are an indicator of who exactly God is. But let's look at the pages of the Bible itself to see that God wants us to count things. First of all, Revelation chapter 13, verse 18, here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And his number is six hundred, three score, and six. So here we have a verse in the Bible that tells us that wisdom will come from counting a number. And it actually gives us a number. That number is six hundred, three score, and six. Now when we get into the part of this DVD series that talks about the number six, we will look more in depth at what is the, the meaning of six hundred, three score, and six. But I remember looking at this verse and I'm going, well, right here it says that wisdom and, and knowledge comes by counting things. So I looked at that number and I thought, I wonder what I will find if I look in the 666th chapter of the Bible. So I counted all the chapters of the Bible and I found the 666th chapter of the Bible. Now I'll tell you that at that time, I thought that I was going to find the name of the beast in that chapter. Well, I didn't. But here is what I found. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, that's the 666th chapter of the Bible. And it says, this is Solomon writing, and he said, I apply in my heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things and to know the wickedness of folly, even of foolishness and madness. And then he says in verse 27, Behold, this have I found, saith the preacher, counting one by one to find the account. So now this is interesting. Solomon said, I sought after wisdom, and I found it by counting. So here we have two verses in the Bible, one Old Testament, one New Testament. They're both telling us that, number, that wisdom can come by counting things, and they're both associated with the exact same number. Now that's part of the, some of the things that I'm going to show you throughout this series of DVDs, is that God's numerical pattern can be found in the King James Version of the Bible. Look at this verse, Leviticus chapter 23. God tells us to count. He says, And ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that ye brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete, even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall ye number fifty days, and ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. And this is the basis for the Jubilee year. Le Leviticus chapter 25 verse 11 he says, A jubilee shall that fiftieth year be unto you. Ye shall not sow, neither reap that which groweth of itself in it, nor gather the grapes in it of thy vine undressed. And so he's telling us that, that he's telling us to count things. And he gives us a jubilee, and he gives us the number 50, and he tells us when to count. So we're going to start out, we're going to start out in this DVD series, and, and, and I've done this teaching before, I've done it in churches and prophecy seminars and so on, and uh, we used to carry a, like a, uh, started out being a one uh, video set, back then we were using VHS cassettes, started out being one VHS that we called the King James Code, and then several years ago we recorded two videos, they started out being v VHS and now DVD, uh, that we called the King James Code, and they were talking about Bible numbers, and so now I'm going to take these numbers, and I'm going to slow way down, 
because I like to hurry through this stuff, but I'm going to slow way down, and we're just going to examine carefully all the numbers. Now, the ones that I know of, the ones that I know of that I feel like are significant, we're going to study these numbers in the Bible, and we're going to let the Bible show us what these numbers mean. So let's look at our Bibles. Genesis chapter 1, we're going to deal with the number 1. The number 1 is the number for beginnings. Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning... God created the heaven and the earth. So that's, that's sort of a, sort of a no-brainer, okay? The number one starts out talking about things that have a beginning. And so here in the very first chapter, in the very first verse of the Bible, we have that theme located, that is the number for beginnings. Now let's look at Isaiah chapter 41, verse 4. Who hath, who hath wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning, I the Lord the first, and with the last... I am he. Now here we have, now this is interesting because I'm going to show you something from this verse. And, and here again, we're going to just kind of, take, kind of take our time through this. And I'm going to show you some things from the scriptures that should back up what you already believe. But if you believe something different, hopefully these videos will shed some light on some things for you so that you can understand what God wants you to understand. Notice in this verse... It says, Who hath wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning, I the Lord the first, and with the last I am he. Now God declares, God declares, I am he. You see in this verse the, the word Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. And everybody knows, or most people know, that in the English King James Bible, that is, a, that is sort of a notation to note that in the original Hebrew here was the name Jehovah, yod Hey vah Hey in Hebrew, it was the name Jehovah. So anytime in the King James where you see the word Lord in all capital letters, in the Hebrew text, it denoted God's personal name, Jehovah. Okay, now, so watch this. In this verse, God is saying, I am the first and I am the last, I am He. Now notice, because there's some people out there who don't believe that Jesus is God. Notice what the next verse says, Revelation chapter 22, verse 13. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. So Jesus is associating himself with Jehovah, and notice that they are telling you that they are both first. And so that gives us a definition of the number one that we've already seen beginnings, and now we're looking at what we call preeminence. Exodus chapter 13, verse 2. Sanctify unto me all the firstborn, whatsoever openeth the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and of beast, it is mine. God said the very first things are always to be mine. That number shows us the preeminence of God. We're going to see more of these verses. Exodus chapter 22, verse 29. Thou shalt not delay to offer the first of thy ripe fruits, and of thy liquors, the firstborn of thy son shalt thou give unto me. Exodus 23, verse 19. The first of the first fruits of thy lamb thou shalt bring into the house of the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not see the kid in his mother's milk. He is telling you that the things that we offer unto the Lord should be the very first of our first fruits. God gets it first. And, and as a pastor, what I will tell you is, is that God is never going to play second fiddle in your band. God must always be first in your life. He said in the Ten Commandments, in the very first commandments, He said, I am the Lord thy God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. In other words, God says, if, if I'm here and you have other gods in front of me, then the other gods in your life are first. God says, only I can be first. Now we have this theme of preeminence. Now let's take it to Matthew chapter 1 verse 25. This is talking about Mary. And the Bible says, and knew her not, talking about Joseph and Mary, Joseph knew Mary not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Now this is very important and what I'm going to do throughout this series is that every now and then I'm going to show you the King James and I'm going to show you how the other Bibles just do not add up to what we see in the King James. Notice the NIV, but he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son. Now this is so, so important because Jesus has to be the firstborn son of Mary. 
or all the prophecies in the Bible and all the law cannot be filled. It's all negated if Jesus is not the firstborn son. And so the question I ask is, why did the NIV choose to leave this out of their Bible? Let's move on. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be, notice the word, added unto you. God is always going to be preeminent in our lives. If, and if we, and here's a promise that Jesus gives us. If we will put God's kingdom first and foremost in every aspect of life, whether it's our personal life, in our marriage, in raising our families, in our country. If we put, I think we ought to put God first in our churches. What a novel idea. That's not being done nowadays. God needs to be first and his kingdom needs to be everything that we think of and everything that we do must be the kingdom of God first. And then God says, I will take care of all these things as you move on. All these things shall be added unto you. So we see the number one being a number for preeminence. Now let's look at the number one as a number four, unity. Genesis, back to Genesis chapter one, verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now, one of the things that I want to draw your attention to in this verse is that notice God is speaking, but God is speaking in the plural. He says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now, I've read Eric Von Donneken's book, Chariots, Chariots of the Gods, and several other things that go along with that. And I know the prevailing theory by these UFO nuts that say that man was seated on earth by the space aliens, and every now and then they come back to check on us, and then eventually they're going to come back and sort of uh, uh, change our DNA so that we can evolve. And they say that this verse here gives proof of that because God really, in their mind, is the space aliens who dropped us off here and, and went away. And they say that they're talking to each other like a little council in their spaceship. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. But if you look at this in the correct way, you see that the Lord our God is one Lord, and we're going to look at that verse in a minute. But God says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. How many things here? Three, because God speaks in patterns. He speaks in a notable rhythm throughout the pages of the Bible. And when God says, let us make man in our image after our likeness, what is he referring to? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. I'm sorry if you don't believe that, but that's exactly what this verse is getting at. Is that the, the Bible says in 1 John 5, 7, that these three are one. And we're going to look at that verse here in just a few minutes. And so, but notice the rhythm and the pattern that the Bible lays out. And it all speaks of this same number, the number one. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Look at what Jesus said. I and my Father are one. First John 5, 7, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And so the Bible's telling us that God is one. It's almost like it's giving you his name, and we're going to look at some verses in a little bit that talk about that. But here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. And then we see in John, 1 John 5, 7, these three are one. Now I'm going to I'm going to show you something neat here that sort of goes along with this theme that we've been laying out here for you the number 1 and the number 3. Take a look at this little graphic up on the screen. It is a representation of the water molecule. Now I want you to notice just look at it. How many parts does it have? It has one, two, three parts. And everybody knows the formula for water, it's H2O, which means two parts hydrogen and one part Oxygen. Now, this is neat because water is the essential basis of all life. And everything that is alive has to have water. And if you look at the Bible, you'll see that water plays an eminent part or a very important part in the scriptures. Water is everywhere. There's, in fact, there's hardly a story where it doesn't mention something about water or something about the absence of water in the scriptures. Baptism is basically it is, is talking about water. And we're to be baptized how? In the name of the Father and of the Son 
and of the Holy Ghost and baptized in water. And take a look at this molecule again because the two parts hydrogen, I'm going to show you this now. This is neat because God is the one who designed the elements. And it just so happens that hydrogen, if you remember the, uh, that, uh, that scale of elements that you, that you had in grade school that we were supposed to memorize, I didn't memorize them. But if you look at the, the uh, periodic table of the elements, you'll notice that hydrogen is number one. Hydrogen is number one. And in this water molecule, we have two parts of hydrogen. That is what Jesus said, I and the Father are one. I and the Father are one. Those are the two parts hydrogen. Now we get to the third part of the Godhead, which is the Holy Spirit. The word spirit means breath. In the Greek, the word pneuma means breath. In the Hebrew, I can't remember what the word was, but it means breath as well. It means air. It means all of those things together. And what is, the, what is the most important part of air that we breathe and breath? It's oxygen. And here we have in hydrogen, or excuse me, in water, all of the elements of the Godhead put together. I believe God did that on purpose. We also see John chapter 17, verse 11. Jesus prays for us, his disciples, his church. And he says, now I am no more in the world but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep, and by the way, he wasn't speaking to the Pope there. He was speaking to his Heavenly Father. Now I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thine own, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. So here we have this idea of unity. And oh, what a blessed thing it will be. When the words of Christ finally come to fruition, that God's people will be one as, God, as Jesus and his Father are one together. Hallelujah. Looking forward to that. And here's a picture of that. Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 1. And all the people gathered themselves together as one Man, You see that phrase, gathering together, is a phrase that talks about what's going to take place in the end times when all of the peoples of the world are going to be gathered together as one man. And that one man is none other than Jesus Christ himself. Remember, church, we are his body. And we're going to be joined together with him one of these days uh, in the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Looking forward to that day. And it's not going to happen through the United Nations either. That is never going to happen. Only Jesus can gather together everybody uh, as one man. Acts chapter 2 verse 46. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. And so God is laying out, look at all these, these one passages in the Bible, talking about unity, talking about uh, common things, a singleness of heart and so on. That's because in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 3, the Bible says, endeavoring to keep the unity, that word unity means one, of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Or as they say down in Alabama, in y'all. Okay? But notice here we have the word one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven times. Seven is a perfect number. We're going to get into that number, not in this video, but as we move forward in our teaching of Scripture Numerics, we're going to look at that. But we have all these things that are to be one, and there are seven occurrences of that in this passage here. And that's because we are in the unity of the Spirit. And the Spirit's number is seven. Because John sees the seven golden candlesticks. He sees seven of them there. That represents the Spirit. The menorah in the tabernacle had seven candles. The seven spirits of God, uh, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, gives you the identification of those seven spirits of God. Notice in Genesis chapter 11, well, let's look at another theme of this. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. Now that was God's way. God, when he put man on this earth, he gave mankind one language and one speech. But notice now, and here we're going to look at sort of a side item of the number one. We're going to look at the number 11. So if we look at the number one, we see unity and things that are together and things that are bonded together. One spirit, one, one, uh, one Bible, okay? We look at all these things here. But then in Genesis chapter 11, we see that the number 11 
is the number for confusion. Look at this next verse. Go to, let us go down. This is what God is saying after they're trying to build the Tower of Babel. And there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. And we know God did just that. And now there's hundreds of languages all over the world and we can't understand what's going on. That's because of the judgment of Almighty God. So we see the number 11 has to do with confusion or confounding or chaos, as it were, things that are broken down, whereas the number one points to things that are brought back together. Let's look at other uses of the number 11. Matthew chapter 28, verse 16. Then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. The number 11, the number for confusion. Mark chapter 16, verse 14. Afterward, he appeared unto the 11, as they sat at meat, and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. Notice disbelief and the number 11. Luke chapter 24, verses 9 through 11. And returned from the sepulcher and told all these things unto the 11 and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other woman that were with them, which told these things unto the apostles. And their words, verse 11, seemed to them to, as idle tales, and they believed them not. Acts chapter 2, verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judah, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words, for these are not drunken. As you suppose, seeing is but the third hour of the day. And we know this passage is when God the Spirit poured out the gift of unknown tongues or unknown languages to the disciples on that day. They were not speaking gibberish. They were speaking the languages that were represented there. And there were 17 of those. And we'll talk about that when we talk about the number 17. But they were speaking human intelligible languages there on the day of Pentecost. God poured that out to them. But those who didn't understand... Because of the 11 thought that they were drunken. Now let's take that theme. And why were they speaking in all these other tongues and all these other languages? Because it was meant to be a confusion sign to Israel who had just rejected the Messiah. Notice Isaiah chapter 28 verse 11. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. It was prophesied in Isaiah 28 verse 11. And we see the word tongue is mentioned exactly 33, which is 11 times 3 times in the New Testament of the King James Bible. Here again, you won't find that pattern in the other English translations. You'll only find in the King James. Now let's move back forward to Calvary. Let's look at what happened here. Was a spirit of, of confusion poured out to Israel. Matthew chapter 27, verse 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Sama Sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, we have the translation or the interpretation of what Jesus said for us in our Bibles. But notice there at the foot of the cross, some of them that stood there when they heard that said, this man called for Elias. They didn't understand what he was saying. And it's very interesting because what he was saying was a direct quotation from Psalm 22. Now the number 22 is the number for revelation. And look at what Psalm 22 says. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And there are all kinds of prophecies in Psalm 22 that had they understood them and what he was quoting, they would have seen that they pierced his hands and feet, that they parted his, lot, his garment and cast lots for his vesture, that they, they, they mocked him, and all those things that they did to Jesus on the cross were prophesied in Psalm 22. And he tried to quote it for them, but they had confusion and they didn't understand. And not only a spirit of confusion poured out to them then, but a spirit of confusion is going to be poured out again in the last day. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 Verse 11, and for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. It's going to happen again on a grand scale. That's why it's so important. That's why, that's why I feel the need to get these teachings out for people so that they could understand that the Bible is the word of God. And if they'll believe the scriptures, 
they will not believe the lie that is going to be told. And this whole thing with the number 11, take a look at this next graphic here. That says it all right there. Was there confusion and chaos on that day? Absolutely. And our ministry has a video called The Babel Conspiracy, and we talk about that and its relationship to the number 11. All you have to do is get in contact with our ministry. We'll get you a copy of that. Now back to unity. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 21. In the law it is written with men of other tongues and other lips. Well, I speak unto this people, and yet for all that they will not hear me, saith the Lord. Now, Paul is quoting Isaiah chapter 28, verse 11. And he's quoting it in the context of speaking in unknown tongues. Now, I don't want to make anybody mad, but there is a lot of deception and a lot of misunderstanding about what speaking in an unknown tongue really is. And I'm not going to get much into that, but I will tell you, let's look at this same chapter in the Bible and let's follow the formula that God himself, himself lays down in understanding the rules concerning speaking in unknown tongues. Watch this. You're going to be amazed. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 27. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most three, and that by course, and let one interpret. Now here's one of the most amazing things that I've ever understood about the Bible. You see, originally, and I was taught in Bible college, and I went to Bible college, I was taught in Bible college that the only real way to understand the Bible is to understand three languages that hardly anybody on the planet speaks anymore. That is Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Because those are the language that the Bible was originally written in. And yet God said that he would speak in other languages. And we see evidence of that on the day of Pentecost, that God was speaking to mankind, not in Hebrew, not in Greek, not in Aramaic, but he was speaking to them in all the languages that they would have understood during that day. So God always had in mind that he was going to speak through the interpretation of, of the three original languages. So here we have a Bible that they say that if you want to master it, you must master Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. And yet we have here this very pattern here. We have three unknown languages. You don't know them. I don't know them. And the Bible says that if any man, if any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most three, and that by course, and let one interpret or translate. So here we have in the King James Bible a fulfillment of the requirement of speaking in three unknown tongues. One interprets the three languages that you and I don't know. Hallelujah. Let's look at the number one as God's name. I mentioned that earlier. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord, and watch this, and his name, one. And see, I, I know you can look that, at that a different way. His name uh, being uh, sort of singular or unified or whatever that is. And I, and I understand that and I go along with that. But just look at what it says. And his name, one. So let's, let's say that, that the name, one of the names of God is one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. He is called the Holy One of Israel. And it says that his name is one. Numbers chapter 7, verse 89. And when Moses was gone into the tabernacle of the congregation to speak with him, then he heard the voice of one speaking unto him from off the mercy seat. 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 22. Whom hast thou reproached and blasphemed, and against whom thou hast exalted thy voice and lifted up thine eyes on high, even against the Holy One of Israel? Now, watch this now. Revelation chapter 4, verse 2, And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Now see, that's the same one that Moses heard speaking. The voice of one was heard. Now that is the King James Version rendering of this scripture. And we all know who this is. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And so John hears the voice of, or Moses heard the voice of one, and John says he sees one sitting on the throne. Look at the New International Version rendering of that verse. And there before me was a throne in heaven with 
someone sitting on it. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think for a minute that John had any misunderstanding whatsoever about who was sitting on God's throne. And of course, we know that the NIV is so corrupt and it corrupts the very understanding of who, my friend, is sitting on the throne. And I believe in a conspiracy. I believe that there is a great, big, gigantic conspiracy that is governing a lot of things that are going on on planet Earth right now. And it's, the conspiracy involves someone else who wants to sit on the throne of God. And that someone is Lucifer. He said in Isaiah 14, uh, 12, God said, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? How art thou uh, cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. He says in Ezekiel chapter 28, I am God. I sit in the seat of God. That's what Lucifer wants. Number one, he wants to sit on the seat of the throne in your life. He wants to rule over you instead of letting God do it. I suggest you let God do it. Life is just a lot easier that way and hell's too hot, okay? But anyway, someone else who wants to sit on God's throne corrupted the true word of God by making it difficult to understand who sits on the throne of God. And let's take that theme now into, uh, and this is something that we haven't done in our previous versions of uh, this teaching of the King James Code or Scripture Numerics and Bible Prophecy, is that we're now we're going to look out into the occult world because, as I said, I would not study Bible numerics because I was afraid that it was occult numerics. Now, what I found out was, was that occult numerology mirrors the Bible teaching of these numbers. And so here we have this number one, and it talks about beginnings. It talks about God's preeminence. Uh, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. We have one sitting on the throne. We have the three who are one. And all of these things, let's look at an occult version of this. And it happens to do with the Antichrist, who is referred to as the one. The one. First of all, take a look at this website. There's a movement of joining all of the world's religions together, and it's called the One Movement. And Rick Warren is involved in this One Movement. Now, that might make you mad that I said that, but it should make you mad that he's involved in it. In fact, if you will go to this website, you will find out that Rick Warren endorses this. The union together of all of the world's religions together to promote the One. You see there the graphic of the World Trade Towers. Their official, uh, their official address was One World Plaza. One World Plaza. Now remember a while ago we were talking about this theme of the number one and how God, there's one body and one spirit and, and one language and all this stuff and God was going to join mankind together as one. If God does it, then it works. If man tries to do it, it won't work. And it's being done, not necessarily by man, but by Lucifer who's, himself, who's trying to gather all the nations together as one on his side. And he's using it, he's doing it through an organization called the United Nations, trying to bring all the nations together as one. As we're recording this video, there's massive talk out there right now about globalizing all of the world's economy, making it one global economy. And all of this is being headed by the Antichrist, who is referred to in the New Age as the One. Take a look at this logo, E Pluribus Unum. And what that simply means is, out of many, one. That's the theme of the United Nations. That's what they were trying to do at, at Babel. That's what they're trying to do right now. They're trying to gather everybody together as one. And they are going to be gathered together, but it's going to be in a place called Armageddon. Revelation chapter 9, go read it. E, pluritum, e pluribus unum, out of many, one. Back several years ago, there was a movie called The One. 
And it was about a man who lived in this, in this idea of parallel universes and he killed off all of the people who were him in these parallel universes. It's kind of weird to follow. So that he could get all of their powers in him. And the speculation was, is that if he was the only one left, then he would sort of be a god over all the universes. He would be the one. Take a look at this one. This is Neo from the Matrix trilogy. He is referred to as constantly throughout all of these. And by the way, this whole thing was about the birth of the Antichrist and the rise of the Antichrist and all these things. That was what it was all about. And he is referred to as the one in these pictures. We see Albert Pike from Morals and Dogma, page 357, refers to the one in symbolical forms, the mysteries exhibited the one. Who's he talking about? He's, of course, talking about the Antichrist, who is called the one. In Blavatsky's The Secret Doctrine, she says the esoteric theogony begins with the one. She's referring to the coming one who's going to save the planet from all these things. Now, there's a Bible out there called the Message Bible. It's probably one of the worst translations out there, and there are worse ones coming down the pike. But the Message right now is one of the most popular Bibles being sold, it's, and it's in all these churches, and it is so New Age. And the Message Bible constantly refers to the one, the one, the one. And it capitalizes uh, the letter O in the, in, the, uh, in the name one so that you understand that it's talking about a person or an entity. Notice what it says. In the book, Unmasking the New Age, we find this quote, The root idea of the New Age is oneness, unity, and wholeness. The one for all. Ray Young, in, in a book called A Time of Departing, said, This oneness of life is the crux of the New Age movement. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 6, in the message, says, Everything you are and think and do is permeated with oneness. And I found this graphic here advertising what so-called a, a sort of Christian gathering called a call to oneness. Now there are many occult symbols in this saying and I, I don't have time to deal with that on these videos. But just to let you know that there is a massive push to bring all the religions together, all the Protestant denominations, in with Roman Catholicism, in with the cults, in with all the religions of the world to be one. And God says, stay away from that. Come out of her, my people, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and I will be your God, and ye shall be my people. Let's have discernment as we see things approaching in the last days. Now let's look at the number two. You see there the graphic up on the screen. Amos chapter 3 verse 3. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Now this is one of those wise things in the Bible. The Bible is just full of wisdom. It's full of practical information for us. And truly, truly we can see this in marriage. We can see this in, in politics. We can see this in, in business. We can see this in family relationships. We can see this in church relationships. That the Bible is true and it questions can two walk together except they be agreed. And so the number two has the theme of, of agreement. It has the, has the theme of unity together. And we see a perfect illustration of that in the pages of the Bible. Now I hold in here in my hand a, a, a copy of the King James Bible. It is naturally divided into two sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament. One cannot be without the other. And if the New Testament contradicted the Old Testament, then it wouldn't be the Word of God. It wouldn't work because these two cannot stick together except they be agreed. And so as you study the Scriptures, as you study the Old Testament, and as you study the New Testament, you will find that the Old agrees with the New, and the New agrees with the Old. And they are never, ever contradictory to one another. And so the Bible is the fruition of this verse can two walk together except they be agreed? The Old Testament and the New Testament. Here's another verse, and I'm going to show you an amazing thing out of this. Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. He's talking about the Bible. No one of these shall fail. None shall want her mate. For my mouth it hath commanded, and his spirit it hath gathered them. 
Now watch this. We already know that the Old Testament and the New Testament, they agree together. And as you read the Old T Testament, you can find things in the Old Testament that you can see linked in the New Testament. You'll be able to find things in the New Testament that you see linked in with the Old Testament. Ta now take a look at this graphic here because I'm going to show you something. This is DNA. This is deoxyribonucleic acid. And we have a video on this called Jesus Christ DNA and the Holy Bible. And I spend an hour and a half showing you the amazing things about DNA. But let me just illustrate this for you very quickly. DNA has two strands. One, two. So let's say that they represent the Old Testament and the New Testament. When DNA is, is divided and, and, and a new cell is formed from that, the DNA is split apart and one strand of that DNA goes into the new cell. Now, how does the new cell know how to replicate the other strand of DNA so that the two can be together? That's because the DNA strand itself is consisted of four base pairs called adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thiamine. And there are rules concerning those four base pairs. And those rules are that adenine can only link with thiamine and guanine can only link together with cytosine. So in the new cell, when you have one strand and you have adenine here, then the new cell knows that it must replicate thiamine on this part. And that's really, the, if you look at that verse again, none shall want her mate. God's word is perfect, even right down on the DNA molecular level, that the basis of all life is that the two strands must agree and none shall want her mate. Notice that the number two also deals with how God speaks, and, and God speaks in the Word of God. Isaiah 28, verse 9, Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Notice the, sort of the double talk in this verse here, and it ends up with here a little and they're a little. That's because you can't just read one part of the Bible and understand the whole Bible. I suggest that you read here a little and that you read there a little. And as the more that you read the Bible, then this little bit is going to, you're going to find it's going to link with this little bit and it's going to make a lot of sense. That's because they walk together and they are in agreement. Job chapter 33, verse 14. For God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth it. Here we're dealing with the number two, and we're looking at the word of God. Old Testament, New Testament. Psalm 62, 11. God has spoken once, twice have I heard this, that power belongeth to God. Here is another witness that says that God speaketh twice. Genesis chapter 41. And for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice, it is because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. And so here we have all these verses that say God speaks once, yea, twice. And so if you're a Jew and you only have the Old Testament, you're not getting the full picture because God speaketh once, yea, twice. If you're one of these uh, church groups that only believes that you only read the New Testament and the Old Testament is done away, then you won't get the whole picture either, my friend. You, you've settled on the fact that God only speaks once at a time. But God speaks once, yea, twice, and those two always agree with one another. We looked at this number, uh, sort of an expansion of this number in the segment on the number one, but let's look at it more fully because now that we see that God speaks, speaketh once, yea, twice, when we take the number two and convert it to the number 22, we have a number for revelation. The number 22 being the number for revelation. And the book of Revelation itself has exactly 22 chapters in it. And look at Revelation chapter 22. Look at all the things the themes in the uh, chapter 22 that refer to revelation or sight or having things revealed. And he showed me a pure river of water of life. Revelation 22, 4, and they shall see his face. Talking about the face of God, which was hidden from Moses in the Old Testament, one book, but now was revealed the face of God in the book of Revelation in the second Speaking of God, the New Testament, they shall see his face. Revelation 22, 5, for the Lord God giveth them light. Revelation 22, 10, and he saith unto me, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Now we have a book in the Old Testament, the book of Daniel, which is God speaks once, where the book is sealed. Now we have a book, the last book of the Bible, 
the book of Revelation. And by the way, Daniel is the 27th book of the Old Testament. Revelation is the 27th book of the New Testament. And they go together. And one is sealed and one is unsealed. The number 22 being the number for Revelation. Mark chapter 4 verse 22. For there is nothing hid which shall not be manifested. Neither was anything kept secret but that it should come abroad. The number 22, wisdom. The word wisdom is used in exactly 222 verses of the King James Bible. The word truth is used in exactly 222 verses in the Bible. The word known is used exactly 222 times in the King James Bible. Here are other words associated with brightness 22 times, discovered 22 times, learned 22 times. The word known 222 times in the Bible. The word taste 222 times. You say, well, Brother Mike, what does the word taste have to do with revelation? This verse, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. It's talking about revelation. The word mystery is found 22 times. And I'll tell you why the word mystery is mentioned 22 times and the theme that's associated with Revelation here in just a little bit. But let's look at the 22nd chapter of the Bible. And what we're going to find is a revealing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Genesis chapter 22, verse 2. And he said, he's, God is talking to Abraham, and he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, can you think of who in the Bible is the only begotten Son? It's Jesus Christ. Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee in the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. That is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ at the exact place. And, and, and prophetically, uh, God showed Abraham and God showed us, Genesis chapter 22, a revelation of the sacrifice of the beloved only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. We saw this earlier, Psalm chapter 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It was intended to be a revelation. And to us who read not just the Old Testament, but the New Testament along with it, we see that what Jesus spoke on the cross is a, uh, is a revelation of what he was talking about in the Old Testament. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The theme of Revelation has to do with your eyes being opened. John chapter 9 verse 14, And it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. And these words, opened and eyes, you'll find in the exact same verse together exactly 22 times. Now I'm going to show you something that if you know somebody that's Jewish, give them a copy of this and let them see it. I don't know that it'll make much difference in their life, but I promise you God is, is going to show Israel a very special thing that they can relate to that's going to prove to them that the New Testament was written specifically for them. A new promise God said he was going to make with Israel. We know that the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. And there are 22 letters in the Hebrew Aleph Bet. And I call it Aleph Bet because it starts with Aleph Bet and, and, and so on. There are also 22 books called letters or epistles in the New Testament. Now that is going to match the Hebrew alphabet. And the word letter or letters is mentioned exactly 22 times in the New Testament. And here's what they said about Jesus. The Jews marveled at Jesus because they said, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? So the use of the word matches the numerics of the word, the number 22 and revelation. And they used the word letters and they said, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? Because it was revealed to him by his father. Now take a look at this. There are 22 letters in the Hebrew Aleph Bet. There are five final forms, which means that there are five of these letters out of the 22 that when they appear at the end of a word, they take on a slightly different form. So the total number of letters in the Hebrew alphabet is 27. Now this word mystery comes into play. Because we find the word mystery is mentioned exactly 22 times. And yet the word mysteries, a a different form of the word mystery, is mentioned exactly 5 times. That makes... 27. And look at this verse, Romans chapter 11, verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant 
of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Now, see, this is amazing. Because every time you find the word mystery in the Bible, you're going to find that there's a revealing of the mystery. Now, God says in this verse of Israel that something is wrong with them. That they are partially blinded. And I want you to get this because we have two testaments in the Bible and blindness has to do with our two eyes. One, two. And the problem with Israel is that they can only see one testament of the Bible. That's blindness in part. And one of these days, God is going to open up their eyes and they're going to be able to see the Old Testament and the New Testament And Jesus Christ is going to be revealed to them in the last days. This pattern of 22 and and 5 and 27, there are exactly 27 books in the New Testament. Five history books and 22 letters. It's the two testaments of their two eyes being open. The phrase, all things, is used exactly 220 times in the King James Bible. Now I'm starting to give you numerical patterns that are found in the King James. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7, the Bible says, Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. So we have the phrase, all things. It's found 220 times in the Bible. That's a number for the double witness of the Bible and revelation of the Bible. And here we have its usage in the Bible, referring to the Bible, when Paul said, uh, the Lord give thee understanding in all things. It is my heart's desire, and I hope it's your heart's desire, that as we study the scriptures, we, we, we need not that man teaches us anything. All we need is the scriptures to open our eyes and reveal. The Lord will give us understanding in all things. And I'll say this concerning what I'm teaching you, is that there are two types of people who may watch this video. Those whom the Lord will give understanding, and those who watch things like this, or other ones, other other teachings out there, or just reading the Bible, the Lord will not give them understanding. And the reason why the Lord will not give them understanding is because the hardness that is already in their heart. 1 John chapter 2, verse 20. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. There it is. All things. Revelation and, and, and knowledge. The phrase Son, capital S, is used exactly 220 times in the New Testament of the King James Bible. Now think about this. All things and the Son. Now let's look at this verse, Luke chapter 18, verse 31. Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son, capital S, of man, shall be accomplished. This Bible is an amazing piece of work. And God is the author of order, and he put all of these things in order for us so we could understand these things as we approach the last days. Now let's look at a theme in the Bible associated with the number two of things that happen twice. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at something that happens the first time. We're going to look at something that happens the second time. Take a look at Exodus chapter 32, verse 15. And Moses turned and went down from the mountain, and the two two tables of the testimony were in his hand. Now I'll stop right here. The two tables would correspond to the two testaments of the Word of God. So here again we see this number two present. The two tables of the testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides. There's the number two again. On the one side and on the other were they written. Now that's the first time that Moses came down from the mountain with these two tables in his hand. When he came down the first time, we know if you've, if you've read the Bible, of course, if you've seen uh, uh, Charlton Heston in the Ten Commandments, you know this, that when Moses came down the first time, Israel was in the process of breaking every one of those commandments that Moses had in his hand. And Moses was angry and he cast those commandments down. Now this is all a picture of something and I'm going to show you this. But now Moses is going to do it again. He's going to come down from the mountain the second time. God speaketh once. God speaketh twice. And it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mountain, that Moses wist not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with them. That's revelation. 
things that shine with light, things that are clear, is the theme of Revelation. That's the theme of the number 2 and the number 22. So we see that Moses not only did it once, but did it twice. Now, this all has to do with the one whose coming was one and then two. And we're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Because when Christ came down the first time, he came in the image, watch this, the Bible says, he came made under the law, made in the fashion of the law. That's the two tables that Moses are holding in his hand. And they're cast down to the ground and they're broken. Jesus said, this bread represents my body, which is broken for you. So watch this. The apostle Paul equates the face of Moses with the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7. But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13 says, And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil, untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now, oh, I like this. Because, number one, it reveals things to us. Number two, it gives us a promise. And that promise is that one of these days, Israel is going to understand who the Messiah is. You see, Jesus comes down, or excuse me, Moses comes down from Mount Sinai the second time. The first time, the second time. Jesus came down from heaven the first time. He's coming down again in a blaze of glory. He's going to come down again. Moses come down, comes down the second time, and they have to put a veil over his face because his face is shining like the sun. That's Matthew chapter 17. That's what happened to Jesus. Okay? So anyway, they had to put a veil over his face. And Paul said that every time the Jews read the Old Testament, the veil is still there. But one of these days, the veil is going to come off. It's going to be revealed. Who? And when the veil comes off, who are they going to see under that veil? They're going to see the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And he's coming again without sin. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Now, I'm going to take this. I want you to remember this now. Because the first time Jesus comes and he's made, he's made to be sin for us who knew no sin. He didn't sin. But God laid upon him all the sins of mankind. So the first time he comes, it's sin. The second time he comes, it's without sin. And a picture of sin in the Bible is leprosy. Let's go back to the Old Testament. Let's look at Moses again and see this acted out in Bible typology. Exodus chapter 4, verse 6. And the Lord said furthermore unto him, Put now thine hand into thy bosom. And he put his hand into his bosom. And when he, was, when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. And he said, Put thine hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again and plucked it out of his bosom. Behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. Now I have a teaching on this and we have a video called Jesus Christ DNA in the Holy Bible and I show you all the elements that deal with the hand but I want you to picture this hand as the Lord Jesus Christ because first of all Jesus said in John chapter 1 he said I, I was in the bosom of the Father and so Moses takes his hand out of his bosom and when he, when he brings it out the first time it's full of leprosy and leprosy is a picture of sin. And so he puts it back into his bosom because Jesus took the sins of mankind as the high priest and he ascends to the holy place in heaven as the high priest, taking our sins with him, laid upon him, and he presents them there upon the mercy seat of Almighty God and his blood as well. And when he comes back again, now he's going to pluck it out of his bosom the second time. And it's there and it has no leprosy. In fact, look at this verse again. It was leprous as snow. God told Isaiah, though your sin be as scarlet, it shall be white as snow. This is such a beautiful, beautiful picture. The first time and the second time. The first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ 
and the second coming without sin. And he says, if they will not hearken to the voice of the first sign, and Israel didn't. They didn't believe the voice of the first sign when Jesus, their Messiah, came down and the sins of mankind were laid upon him. That they will believe the voice of the latter sign. And of course, we know that he's talking about the latter days. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 14, that I will give you the rain of your land in his due season, the first rain and the latter rain, that thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thine oil. It has to do with the first coming of Christ is the first rain and the second coming of Christ is the latter rain. God's going to do great things in the world in those days. Haggai chapter 2 verse 9. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former. And he's talking about the temple. And, and was Solomon built a temple? It was glorious. And God descended upon it. First Kings chapter 8. God descended upon it. And there was a cloud and there was a shout. And all these things taking place. And it was just a glorious day. But God said the glory of the latter house is going to be greater than that of the former. Now we know that they rebuilt the temple. But it too was destroyed, and it had no glory in it. What temple was he talking about? He was talking about the temple of our body, of God's people that he's going to dwell in in the last days. And notice, the latter is better than the former. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 2, I love this. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem, and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is, is pardoned, for she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. In fact, it says in Isaiah chapter 40 verse 1, it says, comfort ye, comfort ye. God says it twice because God speaks once, yea, twice. And there was a Holy Ghost outpouring on the day of Pentecost. That's God speaks once. And we know that the Holy Ghost is the comforter that God, that Jesus talks about. And the Holy Ghost was poured out the first time. Acts chapter 2 the Holy Ghost is going to be poured out again so that it can give life to the dry bones in the valley called Israel. Now let's look at this number two as a number for union. Genesis chapter two. And, and I'm giving you these things because you can see the numerical meaning of a number or the biblical symbolical meaning of a number in the Genesis chapter. Genesis chapter one was beginnings. Genesis chapter two is a number for union. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Now, get this in your understanding. Here is the man, and here is the woman. There are two, and God brings them together, and they shall be one flesh. Ephesians chapter 5 explains this. The Bible says, For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall be joined into his wife, and they too shall be one. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. The two are going to be joined together as one one of these days. I'm looking forward to that, and I hope that you're looking forward to that, and I hope that you're not going to be deceived into thinking that the false Christ is the real Christ. Study your Bibles. Be a brand so that you know the difference. Because I'm going to take this theme in just a few minutes, this theme of, of marriage. And here we go back again to this thing we talked about a while ago. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Now, God is not giving a commendation of divorce for people. In other words, for you to say, well, uh, me and my husband or me and my wife, we don't get along. So we, God said we should divorce. That's not the case. You should ask and seek out God so that you too can both walk together. And by the way, let me show you this too. Because the Bible says, and the two became one flesh. Well, that is a perfect picture of what happens as the result of the union of a man with a woman. The two become one flesh in that, through that, they have a child. And that child is is the one flesh of the man and the woman coming together. All those scenes are so beautifully portrayed for us in the scripture. Paul said this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So that's the theme of the number two. Even when we go back to Genesis chapter 22, which deals with Revelation, we saw that Isaac was revealed in, in Genesis 22, but we also have a revealing 
of Rebekah. There's Isaac in verse 2, and in verse 23, we have the introduction of Isaac's wife, Rebekah. Remember, Isaac is a picture of Christ. Rebekah then would be a picture of his bride. If we go to the 22nd book of the Bible, and see, I just believe that it's all laid out in order. I've heard what the scholars say that only the original manuscripts and chapter and verse divisions and Bible order doesn't mean anything, but I'm telling you that everything was laid out in perfect order by a God who governs everything in the universe, and we, can, we should expect that that order would be found in the pages of the Bible. 22nd book of the Bible is the Song of Solomon. And it talks about, and the Song of Solomon is about the bride and the bridegroom. Christ and the church coming together. You see, uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 3 uses the word virgins. The word virgins mentioned 22 times. That's because the bride has to be pure. Amen? The bride needs to be pure. And we cannot purify ourselves. Only Christ can purify us. Matthew chapter 25, we have a story of 10 virgins, mentioned 22 times in the Bible, Revelation, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto 10 virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. So now we're seeing all these themes here. We look at the number two as the number for witness at the mouth of Two witnesses, or three witnesses, shall he that is worthy of death be put to death, but at the mouth of one witness he shall not be put to death. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, This is the third time I am coming to you, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. And now we see that God in Revelation chapter 11, verse 3, says he's going to give power unto his two witnesses. Now I believe in a, in a last day's fulfillment of this. Don't get me wrong. But I also believe that God gives power to the two witnesses of the Holy Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament, walking together, agreeing together, saying the same thing, and God puts power in His book. Listen, preacher, the power in your church is not you. The power in your church is not the sermons that you downloaded from Rick Warren. The power, in, listen, the power in your church is not your music. It's not in your beats or your rhythms or your drums or your guitars or your light show or the, or the manifestations you say of the Spirit in your church. The power in your church is the Word of God. God said, I will give power unto my two witnesses. And if you get to know me in my ministry well enough, you know, you know that I'm all about the Bible. If we don't have the Bible, we don't have anything. And that's just all there is to it. Jesus Christ being the twice spoken word of God. See, he, he is the word of God. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And Jesus is that witness. He is the faithful witness. And why does it say he's the faithful witness? Because he came the first time and he's coming the second time. God speaketh once, that's Jesus coming the first time. God speaketh twice, that's Jesus coming the second time. We see that in the new heavens and a new earth. Revelation 21, 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. That's because God speaketh once, yea, twice. God spoke the old world and the old heavens into existence. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and those are going to pass away, and, and they have to pass away, so that a new heaven and a new earth can take its place. Look at that theme in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 9. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. Old Testament, New Testament. Old earth, new earth. Old heaven, new heaven. Old Mike, new Mike. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Ruth chapter 3 verse 10, I want you to notice this because God lays out a pattern for us that uh, it happens once and it happens twice and if it happens once, it's not as good and it's going to vanish away making way for what happens twice. We see that Old Testament, New Testament, first and second coming. We see it in the new heaven and the new earth. We see it in the new birth and so on. And now watch this. And he said, Ruth chapter 3 verse 10, and he said, Blessed be thou the Lord my daughter, for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, inasmuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. So watch this. God's going to lay a theme. And we're going to look at several verses that deal with this. God's laying a theme out in the scriptures that tell us that the, the beginning is not as good 
as the latter end. And if God does it, then our latter end is better than our beginning. Job chapter 8. Though thy beginning was small, yet thy latter end should greatly increase. Job 42, 12. That's exactly what happened with Job. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. I tell my church all the time, it's not how you start. It's how you finish. I've been pastoring for several years now. I've seen a lot of people come into the church. I've seen a lot of people down at the altar. I've seen a lot of sins dumped out. But it's not how you start. It's how you finish. And if God works in your life, then your finish is better than your start. But if God is not working in your life, then your latter end is going to be worse. Haggai chapter 2 verse 9. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. John chapter 9 verse 2. Here we have the story of Jesus turning water into wine. And look at what it says. It's because it was done by God. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom. Oh, I lo look at the language. And saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. That's man's way. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. Think about it. Now look at 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 20. Look, notice the twos here. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. And so that's why we see 2 Thessalonians 2, Paul talking about a great falling away because there's a lot of people jumping into a lot of churches that start out great and the devil's going to take them. They're going to fall away and their latter end is worse than their beginning. I mentioned before I sat in Bible college and all the Bible colleges, I went to two Bible colleges and a lot of teaching I've heard about the Bible. And the teaching that I heard from all the Bible colleges and what you hear out of practically every Bible college there is, and there are, there are some exceptions, there are some good exceptions, is that the Bible was, and they, and they have it in their faith statement, they make it sound spiritual. We believe the Bible was, is the inspired, inerrant Word of God in the original manuscripts. But what they all believe and what they all teach, what I was taught, and what a lot of other preachers were taught, is that the Bible started out perfect, but over time decayed. That doesn't match God's pattern. God And God is the one who set the pattern. I'm not making this up. You've seen the verses. I let the Bible tell me how to think, not me tell the Bible how I want it to be. God establishes a pattern that the latter end is better than the beginning. But we have this doctrine floating around with no scripture basis whatsoever that said the Bible was perfect at first. But over time it has decayed. Copyist errors, destruction of manuscripts, and, and uh, un, unknowledgeable translations. And they include the King James in that. And they say that the latter end of the Bible is worse than the beginning. That just doesn't wash. And I'm one of these guys, and I know how bad it is. God has given us a watchman-type ministry, and we're seeing in the world how bad it is. But I believe that the greatest days of the church are ahead of us, not behind us. And if you look at the beginning of the church in Acts chapter 2, you can clearly see that it was glorious on that day. And yet I believe, church, that the days ahead of us are far more glorious. Now I'm going to give you a theme in the, in the Bible that uh, uses the number two, and I call it the age of the Gentiles. And, and let me explain that, and then we'll look at some verses here. Uh, I, I've been seeing throughout the scriptures the, the use of the number two and variants of the number two, like 2, 20, 200, 2,000, and so on. All of those are variations of the number two. And so if you're reading the Bible and you see like 20-something or 200-something, or 2,000 something, you, you take it back at its base and it is the number two. And uh, I've been seeing this consistently in the Bible that it has to do with the age of the Gentiles. And let's think about what this means. Uh, since the time of Christ, 
roughly to this time now, and we're not sure exactly when, we're not sure when it started anyway, roughly to now we have about 2,000 years taking place. And I'm going to show you some of this in the scripture and how it parallels what I'm saying. 2,000 years. We know that the Bible says the day with the Lord is a thousand years. So we could say that would be two days in God's weekly calendar that he has. Okay, And that is where God came, Jesus came first to Israel and they rejected him. So God put Israel on the back burner and God now is dealing with the Gentiles. He's building the Gentile body of Christ in these last days. And he's been doing it now for roughly right at 2,000 years. I think we're at the getting close to the point where God's going to cut that off and he's going to deal with Israel once again. And so what I'm going to show you uh, in, in this next section is how this theme of the number two points to not only the age of the Gentiles, but the restoration of Israel after that age is complete. Let's go back now. We've already seen Genesis chapter 2 about Christ and the bride, okay? The Gentile church. Paul said that was Christ and the church. Adam and Eve is a picture of Christ and the church. Now we're going to see, we're going to jump forward in the book of Genesis and let's look at the life of Joseph. We see that Joseph had two dreams, the sun, moon, and stars and the stalks dreams. And they were revealing that his brothers, his brothers would worship him. Now Joseph is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ and his brothers would be the tribes of Israel. We note that Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver, not 30, but 20 pieces of silver. And, and he goes and he's thrown into prison and he interpreted Pharaoh's double dream. He married a Gentile wife and had two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And then we see that two years into the famine, he is revealed to his brothers as their savior after exactly 22 years. And I believe that these are, this is prophetic teachings using Bible typology and the language of the scriptures and numerics all together to understand that this is not just a story that happened once. It's going to happen again. God said that there is no new thing under the sun. That which was is that which shall be. And that is the basis for some of the things that we're teaching here, some of the things you're learning. Now, look at this verse here, Joshua chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, because you, you're going to see that Israel is going to walk into the promised land, and God takes them so that they have to cross the river Jordan to get there. The river Jordan, the, the river would be symbolic of baptism, being baptized in the Spirit of God. And they have to cross the river Jordan. Now, notice how God says for them to do this. And they commanded the people, saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, and the priestly Levites bearing it, then you shall remove from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it about 2,000 cubits by measure. Come not near unto it, that ye may know the way by which ye must go, for ye have not passed this way heretofore. Just look at this. God says you're going to cross Jordan, but the Ark of the Covenant is going to go before you. The Ark of the Covenant is Jesus. The Ark of the Covenant is going to go before you, and then you're going to get to come after it 2,000 cubits. I believe that that's referring to the 2,000 years of the church age. Jesus came once. He's coming again. Once, twice, the number two, two days, 2,000 years. It all makes sense. Hosea chapter 6, verse 2. After two days will he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. It's a promise of the nation of Israel. God says after two days. What day was Jesus resurrected on? After two days on the third day. Here we have the same principle here. After two days on the third day. A day with the Lord being a thousand years. A thousand years being as one day. And we have two witnesses of that in the scriptures. Peter said it and David said it in the Psalms. And all these things are playing together so that we understand that after two days, Israel is going to be revived again. If you look at the story of Abraham back in Genesis chapter 22, when he takes Isaac up to Mount Moriah, the Bible says they traveled for two days. And on the third day, he lifted up his two eyes and he looked and he saw the place afar off. That phrase afar off in the Bible is a prophecy word. It means he was seeing into the future. And exactly from the time of Abraham to the time of Christ was 2,000 years. And it was the exact place at the exact time prescribed in the scripture. When we study these numbers, we're seeing so many amazing things given to us. 
Matthew chapter 20, verse 16. So the last shall be first, and the first last. For many are called, but few chosen. And look, look at stories very quickly in the scriptures that talk about first and last. We have the two sons of Abraham, Ishmael and Isaac. Now, Ishmael was the first to come from the loins of Abraham. He was the firstborn. But he is set back, and Isaac is preferred. The first became last, and the last became first. Now, that is a picture, watch this, that is a picture of Israel and the Gentiles. you saying, how are you getting that, Pastor Mike? Galatians chapter 4, Paul said that Hagar is a representation of all those who were born under the law, Mount Sinai, that's the Jews. Sarah is a representation of heaven. She is the mother of us all, or represents the mother of us all, which is heaven. We are born not of the earth. We are born again the second time from heaven. Heaven is our mother now. She's the one that birthed us, that brought us into being. And I'm not making, that's exactly what Galatians chapter 4 says. New Jerusalem, which is above, is a free, is the mother of us all. And so we have this Ishmael and Isaac representing the Jews and the Gentiles. The Jews were selected first, but they have to be set back. And now the Gentiles come in. But watch this. One of these days, God's going to deal with Ishmael once again. God's going to deal with Israel once again in the last days. Jacob and Esau. Esau was the firstborn. Jacob came right after him. But Esau, like Israel, despised their birthright. And so the blessing of the firstborn son goes to Jacob. Then when Esau comes and he weeps and he begs for his birthright, does his father finally bless him? Zerah and Perez is another example of this. And we can give a, a, a tons of examples of this. Zerah and Perez. Zerah was the first uh, to exit the womb. Remember, I think he, he stuck his, his, his foot or his hand out and they tied a scarlet thread. The word scarlet talking about the blood of Christ. A scarlet thread to him, but he, it, it went back in and Perez came out. And the word Perez means breach because God said that Perez was a breach upon the house of Israel. So Perez breached the firstborn son deal. Perez then is the line that Jesus came from the first time. And Perez was regarded as the firstborn. He breached that. The Bible talks about that Israel, God has breached his covenant. He hasn't done away with his covenant. It's just been breached, divided in two, as it were. And Christ is called, watch this, the repairer of the breach. He's going to join it back together. And we see that in Zerah and Perez. Rachel and Leah. Rachel was the first love, but he has to marry Leah first. You know what that means, church? We're the ugly sister. We're the ugly sister. We weren't the first loved, but we were the first married. And then Rachel is going to come in behind us. Oh, this is so beautiful. And I can talk about this all day long. How God, the first, the second, Israel coming, uh, the, the Gentiles being selected, and then Israel, and all these things. And you see that in, in all these places that deal with the number two. So as you study the scripture, mark things that are two or twenty. We saw uh, 20 pieces of silver, 200, 200 penny worth is insufficient to feed these people. It's referring to what's taking place after 2,000 years of the church age where God is going to save Israel. Now let's look at one last theme here with the number two. Second Corinthians chapter six, we see that number two deals with separation or things that are opposite. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now I want you to notice the sort of the twice speak here, how the pattern uh, of the Bible seems to fit the number two. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? There's a cadence, a pattern. And what communion hath light with darkness? One and two. What concord hath Christ with Belial? In other words, a contract. There was no contract between Christ and Belial. Belial is the devil, but the devil tried to make a contract with Jesus. In the Gospels. Remember he took him, his, Jesus was fasting 40 days. And the devil tried to lock him into a covenant, into agreement. And the Bible says there is no agreement between Christ and Belial. And what we're seeing here is the separation of things that are opposite in the Bible. What part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? And so here we have a theme 
of the separation of opposites. We have a video called The Da Vinci Code Unmasked, and we deal a little bit more extensively with the separation of things that are opposite. God did this on, on the very first day of the creation. The Bible says that God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God called the light good. That's why universally, in just about every culture in the world, light equals good and dark equals bad. Okay? So we have these opposites here. And God divided the light from the darkness. He kept them separate. He did not fuse them together. They are to be separate. What agreement hath Christ with Belial? What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? Absolutely none. They are to be separate. So watch this. Therefore shall a man leave his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Now I'm going back over this because we're going to see uh, how it points to remember there is an occult version of these numbers. Ephesians chapter 5, For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall be joined into his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Now, watch this, because with everything that God does, how you can understand what the devil is doing is to look at what God does. Because the devil sort of, he's, he's kind of hip. He's kind of keyed in to what God's doing. God said in Ezekiel chapter 28, Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. So the devil's not completely stupid. He knows some things. But remember, God is holy. The devil is not. Heaven is holy. Hell is unholy. Heaven is life. Hell is death. There's always an opposite. There is the sky and then there's the earth. God said, My ways are not your ways. They're completely opposite. So in your smart, intelligent thinking, at your best, you're stupider than God. Because God says, my ways are not your ways, and my thoughts are not your thoughts. As far as the heavens are above the earth, that's how high my thoughts are above your thoughts. And boy, I tell you what, with Hubble Space Telescope, we can see that the heavens are huge. And that's how far out of the ballpark we are with God. That's why it's not safe, my friend. It is not safe safe at all to trust any man telling you what this book really says. Only trust this. Let God be true and every man, including Mike Hoggard, be a liar. And I have. I've told things from the pulpit. I've told things to people that simply were not true. I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to lie. And so forgive me if all I can do is show you what's in the pages of this book. Because my thinking is not God's thinking. They're separated out. So anyway, if God thinks one way, then the devil thinks another. And so watch this. If there is, and there is, if there is a joining together of the bride and the bridegroom, and the bride is Christ... Oh, excuse me, and the bridegroom, I got that wrong, didn't I? And the bridegroom is Christ. The, the bride then is his glorious church, the virtuous woman in Proverbs chapter 31, without spot or wrinkle, the virgin bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the beautiful theme of the Bible. Now the devil, and it's not Mary Magdalene either, Okay. Jesus did not marry Mary Magdalene. And, and this is interesting to me because if Jesus married Mary Magdalene and then he's going to marry the church, then he is disqualified from being the bishop of our souls because the qualifications for a bishop is to be the husband of one wife. Just thought I'd throw that in there. Okay? But anyway, Christ and the church. Now there is the exact opposite of that. We have the Holy One and His Holy Bride. Now we have the unholy one and his harlot bride. We see it in the Bible. Genesis chapter 6, verse 2. Verse 2. The sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wise of all which they chose. Now, don't even think for a minute that the sons of God are the lineage of Seth and the daughters of men are the lineage of Cain. That is not, you will never, you will read the Bible a million times and you'll never get that out of there because it's not there. 
The Bible says the sons of God are the angels. Read the book of Job. Read all through the Old Testament. You'll see that the sons of God, they're the, more, they're, they're the stars. They are the angels. The sons of God, the unholy ones who fell. They're the ones who left their first estate. They're the angels that sinned, and they weren't cast to the earth, like some people say. The angels that sinned were cast into the pit, the prison, hell. And they're still there right now. They're held in chains, awaiting judgment. They're going to come out in Revelation chapter 9, but that's another study. The sons of God mingled with the daughters of men, and they created the race of the giants. Let's look at how that theme is being played out in today's world. And I've talked about this in several videos. There was a movie called Starman. And as far as I'm concerned, Starman was the epitome of the, the opposite or the, the exact opposite of Christ and the bride. Here we have an alien, an angel, a star man. Get it? Star, stars are angels. Star man. And he falls to the earth. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Look at the image of the falling star. And he mates with a human woman. By the way, he manipulates DNA. He mates with hu a human woman, and he gives her a child. That theme is there in the Scriptures, and it's the occult form of the union of Christ and His holy bride. Here we have another movie called City of Angels. And we have Nicolas Cage playing an angel called Seth. Now, Seth is another term for Set, which is the occult term for Satan. Okay? It's the occult form of Satan. Here we have an angel, Seth, who falls in love with beautiful Meg Ryan, a human woman, and he is told by a guy named Messenger, who is already an angel that fell, he is told that in order to mate with Meg Ryan, he has to fall. And he does it just that. He, he falls down to the ground, and when he, when he lands on the ground, he is a human male. That's exactly how it's done. Here we have another movie called uh, Rosemary's Baby. It's about the union of Lucifer with a human woman to produce the Antichrist. Here we have the symbol of the yin-yang. It is about the union of opposites. It is also about fusion things that are opposite together. And it's about the fusion of the sons of God with the daughters of men. The exact opposite of the bridegroom and the bride. Here we see another version of this. Uh, of the union of two things that are opposite together. In the symbol of the, uh, the star of David, what they call, which is a, actually a Masonic seal of Solomon... Uh, David didn't have a star. David didn't have a symbol like this. You see the, the two triangles, one pointing up, one pointing down, and they are locked together. That is the fusion of things that are opposite. That represents the unholy bridegroom and the unholy bride, the sons of God and the daughters of men, or Lucifer and his bride. In the cult of Freemasonry, we see that portrayed in their most prominent symbol, which is the square and the compass. And we have several videos that deal with this. Just get in touch with our ministry and we'll send them to you. But the, the idea of the square and compass joining together, and Albert Pike says that the square, rep, the uh, compass represents the male and the square represents the female. And he's using vulgar imagery when he's talking about that. And he's saying that they are fused together. And that's what we get when we look at the number two. So when you see things like duality, uh, in the New Age movement, duality and things like that. You'll see it moving into the emerging church movement. These are things that are not talking about the Holy Bride and the Holy Bridegroom. They're referring to the union of opposites, the sons of God, daughters of men, Lucifer and his whore bride in the last days. Well, we've covered two numbers. We've taken quite a bit of time. And uh, we're going to continue this series as the Lord allows, so be watching for it. This is Pastor Mike. I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you got a lot out of it. And we intend to give you more good, straightforward Bible teaching as the Lord allows us to do. You can go to our website, www.mikehogger.com. If you're living in the Jefferson County area, come see us at Bethel Church. Uh, our website is visitbethelchurch.org. We'd love to have you. May the Lord bless you. God bless you. Bye-bye.